If laughter is the best medicine, my guest today has the cure. He's an Emmy-nominated actor, writer, comedian, and impersonator, and believe it or not, former high school classmate of mine. Yes, that is so true, and I cannot wait to talk with him. Hello, and welcome to Living Well with Robin Stoloff, empowering you to live a healthier life. I am just so excited to welcome John D. Domenico. Thanks for being here, John. Yeah, baby. Thanks for having me on, darling. <laughs> well, that's one of his characters. <laughs> Among many of John's accomplishments, he's been impersonating Austin Powers, as you heard, and Dr. Evil since 1997, awarded Best of Las Vegas Impersonator for the past three years. In 2007, People Magazine wrote that D. Domenico's Powers was the best. John is best known for his award-winning Donald Trump impersonation, as seen on ABC's The View, The Laugh Factory's International Trump Competition, and and many other programs. And he's the official Trump for Conan O'Brien, among others. And he's also performed as Trump on the Howard Stern Show, James Corden, Stephen Colbert. And Di Domenico is the tr- voice of Trump on the best selling audio book, The Method to the Madness. Ooh, I, have that book right here. I love it. You know, and I could go on and on. This is a long bio right here. <laughs> And I'm sorry okay. my phone's ringing, so. Uh, well, that's that's fine. That's fine. People get it, right? We're, we're doing all, always doing it from home. Right. So that's just scratching the surface. And as I said, we were high school classmates. Yeah. And the senior class show, I we were both involved in that. And just oh, yeah. how, how long ago was it that you knew you really wanted to do this? I, you know, I, when I was a kid, I grew up in Ambler, which you know of, and I grew up in the row home section and all the neighbors, this is the late sixties. Uh, and they would all sit out in the summer. And I realized early on, I could do voices, especially like Ed Sullivan. So I would watch Ed Sullivan and then John Biner would be on and I could remember his act. So I would walk outside and there's all the adults sitting out in the summer. I go now, ladies and gentlemen, right here in our <laughs> show. <laughs> the fabulous Garbaccio brothers and Girl Scout Troop 625. Girls, stand up and show us your cookies. And, <laughs> and I was five. I was five and six. And the, You were five neighbor, doing this? <laughs> yeah, I was five. And my neighbor was like, that's, oh my God, who's this precocious kid who was, I, I was, I didn't know I was fearless, but I had no fear. Right. I just wanted to perform. I just wanted the affirmation of people laughing because when somebody laughed, I was just thought that was the greatest thing. Cause I'd watch a comedian, comedian on TV and that audience in New York or LA would laugh. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. So, and that grew into wanting to be an actor, writer, filmmaker, you know, all those wonderful things, except there was one tiny problem. When I wasn't doing an impression, I really couldn't be understood because I had a severe speech impediment. I so, just read that in your bio and I never knew that about you. Talk to yeah. us a little bit about that before we get into your whole career here. So, uh, you know, it, it was, the, again, it was the late sixties and I, I, Basically, from what people told me, my brothers and my mom and my sisters, I sounded like Elma Fudd. Everything in my mouth was really big. So it was like, I have, like, I can do, Austin Powers goes, <laughs> my adenoids really big. My tongue is really big. All of this stuff is really big. And I, I didn't really know how to, the mechanics of how to speak properly. So in all of that time in, in speech therapy, the speech pathologists, the speech therapists were removing the uh, impediment, but the bonus was they were teaching me the mechanics of how to do other voices, throat placement, nasal placement, vocal production, where the sound should be. You know about the vocal mask, how we produce sound here. And then at the point, the point where you hit all together should be right here. But you know, you take all of those things like throat placement, nasal placement, <laughs> cadence. And if, you know, I take all those elements when I do a voice and that's how I break down a voice. Wow. So, so in some ways things. they were training you for your career yeah, today, they, today. They were because I can listen to a voice and go, I'm pretty sure I can do that voice because I can hear the elements and then I just reassemble the elements and do it myself, you know, and certain That's ones are amazing. Easier. Yeah. Well, certain let's talk about easier. that. How did you develop these characters? You were doing Trump before he was president. So yeah. 2004. A long time. Yeah. yeah. So, so how do you develop I, a character? So I always, you know, my whole thing is if I like a voice, 
and as a kid, like I mentioned, Ed Sullivan and John Biner did his act, but then I discovered Groucho Marx. So I list, you know, Groucho is kind of the say the secret word. Remember the way he used to talk? It was yes, very musical. Yes. And he was very funny to me. And he would sing a song um, in one of the movies. It was, hello, I must be going. I came to say, I cannot stay. I must be going. And I always loved his music built into his comedy. A lot of great comedians have kind of a musical element. And he's like one of my base characters in the sense like he's a rock, he's like part of how I speak and how I think. But then like, again, at the same time, Columbo was on when we were kids. So yes. I was thinking, wait a second, wait a second. I, I think I can do that voice. That <laughs> voice sounds, sure, I hate to bother you, but that voice sounds very familiar. <laughs> So one more thing, sir. And I, I just like, oh, I, I did. And so I would hear a voice and I would loved Peter Falk. I mean, I loved as an actor, I loved Columbo. So if I liked a, a character and a voice, I would pick it up. And then years later, I learned Peter Falk was doing Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> and I used to do Humphrey Bogart. You know, Humphrey Bogart used to have the way that he spoke. Listen, listen, sweetheart. You know, he was a kind of a gangster kind of character. But but all of these things start kind of working together because Peter Falk was actually doing Humphrey Bogart and Humphrey Bogart was kind of, he took his thing from somebody else. So all, all voices have elements of other voices. So, um, and the reason I mentioned that is because if you take Trump, which I've been doing now since 2004, there's a little bit of Groucho in him and there's a little bit of, of that, that sound that obviously the New York sound because he's from Queens, but also when I was really trying to crack his voice and get it to be as authentic as possible, I thought, who else is from, who else is from Queens? And who else talks like Trump because he's so unusual? But then I thought about Christopher Walken and Walken, when he speaks, he does that same staccato thing that Trump does. So there's a little bit of walking, there's a little bit of Groucho, there's a little bit of these other, and I kind of can, I kind of build each one based on those vocal elements that I learned from the speech therapists and speech pathologists. I find that so amazing. And how long does it take to perfect something like that? Because you can't just a, do it one day and go out on stage, you know? That's, no, you really can't. You know what it is? It's when I can improvise in the voice when I can really, you know, like Austin Powers I've been doing since a long time, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, with, with Austin Powers, the great thing was I had already been doing Wayne from Wayne's world in 91 and 92. Cause Mike Myers and I are, you, you call it being in the genetic range. So I'm in the same genetic range as Mike Myers. So when he used to do Wayne's World in like 91, all right, excellent. Hi, I'm Wayne Campbell from Aurora, Illinois. <laughs> all right. So I was, so when he came out with Austin Powers and his other characters that he did on SNL, I was like, oh, I can do this. I've already, I've already done one of his voices and I love all things British. So it was very easy to do kind of a, kind of a hodgepodge London accent, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and then with Dr. Evil, I, it was kind of a slower voice. And I noticed it was somewhat like Dan Aykroyd in Trading Places. OK, but they're actually doing Lauren, Lauren you know, the, the, the founder of uh, SNL, the creator of SNL, uh, Lauren Michaels. So Lauren Michaels has many, many impersonators, but Mike Myers basically stole uh, Dana Carvey's. So like so I knew like voice wise, these are really close and I'd be able to do these. And then, you know, you hear a voice and you just work on it and work on it and work on it where all the elements kind of fall into place. Like someone like Dr. Phil, what were you thinking? Okay. Hey, listen, it doesn't matter how flat you make a pancake. It's got two sides. You can dress a squirrel in a kimono, but it still won't speak Japanese. Okay. <laughs> I love it. You were, you just, I, you know, of course I'm going to tell you you're great, but you really are great. <laughs> Oh, and I'm not just thank saying you. that you really are. I didn't even know you did all of those voices. I've seen you do. Yeah. You, this is how we connected. You popped up, I guess, on my TikTok or Instagram. And I'm like, <laughs> well, this guy's a really good Trump impersonator. And then I'm like, hold on a second. John D. Domenico, wait a minute. And <laughs> I was like, I can't get this. I mean, I just, 
I really didn't know that you were doing all this. I and mean, that's how oh, yeah, it's been my it. living. It's been my, yes. you know, I started out as an actor, but you know, you, you, you know, you kind of get pulled to the things that you have the, the, what you really desire, what you have the strengths for. And yes, I, I've yes. just been very, I've been very grateful and very lucky. I've made a really great career, uh, career out of it. And, you know, Trump specifically, because I had been doing him for so long since 2004, when he really announced in 2015, if you Googled Donald Trump impersonator, I was like the only one. Wow. You were ahead of the curve on that. I was ahead of the curve, which which is actually a big part of acting. It's like the actor prepares, it's Stanislavski teaches that. But who knew? I mean, 2004. (laughs) And, And the funny thing was I had met him in 1990 uh, when I performed at the um, at Trump Plaza, I did Tony and Tina's wedding for a year in Philadelphia, oh, okay. and then we moved to the Plaza, and I got to meet him then. But I had been kind of fascinated with him because he kind of, I thought it was like a Horatio Alger story where you know he's poor and he built up this business. Later on, you find out you know his dad gave him fourteen million dollars and three hundred <laughs> million dollars, and you know all this other stuff. All but I just thought he was yeah. And you know the funny thing is. Um, my, I have my copy of Art of the Deal, which my wife at the time, Donna, had given me in 1987. She was a child, she's a therapist. And um, I said, I want the Art of the Deal. And she was like, oh God. So Christmas, I opened, I opened it up and it's the Art of the Deal book. And the inscription is so fascinating to this day. It says, I don't like this guy. I don't like what he stands for, but I know you wanted the book, so Merry Christmas. <laughs> Little little did I know it would become like a five year like monster period in my my career. Gosh, that is amazing. So how not only do you do the voices, you get into full character. And that is to me, that's got to be. I mean, it took me an hour to put my makeup on this morning. How do you do that? You know, just to just to get into that, how, do you have people help you or do you figure it out yourself? Well, I, you know, one of the things is since I studied to be an actor in New York and I was in multiple theater companies and I was lucky to be in some shows with some great uh, makeup artists and great costumers and wardrobe people and all that kind of stuff. When I started doing the impressions, I, for some reason, went right to I, I, I kind of skipped the thing where you get on stage like this and just do a bunch of voices. I was like, well, if I'm going to do a voice, I'm really trained as a character actor. I should do it as a character. It should be a fully developed, um, you know, 3D kind of thing. And that was, that's how I approached all of them. It didn't matter if it was Austin Powers or Trump or Dr. I was shaving my head to do Dr. Phil. So I, I'm, somebody called me an extreme impersonator. I just think I'm an actor doing a character and I want to make it as three dimensional as possible. I don't want it to be a one note kind of thing. I didn't want Trump to be one note. And I, and, and that came much later when everybody and their mother was doing Trump in person. Sure. Sure. But absolutely. I, I wanted to deliver more. I wanted to deliver because a lot of my work, when I do corporate work and I'm on the road, a lot of times there's an element where I have to interact with people and totally ad lib. And that could be an hour or two or sometimes three. So for me, I wanted to be totally vested in the character. So if I interacted with you, you'd walk away and go, I think I just was talking to Columbo, not an impersonator or Austin Powers or Trump. Or, Is it know. hard to switch up? Can you change out of the character and it's, change you know, a new it, one? It's really tough because you were just talking about getting to make it. When I do Trump, it takes about an hour because just to glue the wig on takes about 20 minutes and it's got to wow. be set and pressed in. Then I have to, you know, with makeup, I got to do a base that I'm going to mm-hmm. color my eyebrows and I have to age around here and do the white. And he has my face is um, kind of is round. He's got a longer face. So then I have to contour my nose to make it look longer. And I have to do a cheat thing where I whiten this and it kind of makes my face a little longer. And then I do another trick here where, so I kind of elongate my face and bring the wig back. The wig You really study. You really had to study. Oh, I, have to, I have to. And w- with all of my, with all of my characters, I'm going to use him only because it's, you know, kind of like the, the one I do the most. It, it takes about an hour to get into uh, makeup and then like a few more minutes to get into into wardrobe. And I do it myself. And I worked with a, uh, a couple of makeup artists who helped me design the makeup. 
So I would be able to apply it. I am not a makeup artist because my joke is my makeup never looks the same twice. I do all the steps, but it never looks the same twice. Sometimes I'll be like, this is pretty good. This looks really good. And other times I'm like, wow, that's way too wide. Recognize. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, but but ha- having them help me design all the makeup for Guy Fieri and Austin Powers and Dr. Evil and all these things, it's, it's, it's a huge help. And I'm very self-sufficient and I like, I'm a self-starter. Obviously you are too, because this is how we are. This is how we kind of survive. And is it thrive. a Philly thing? I don't know. Is it a Philly thing? I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I just love, uh, I'm, I'm just like a, I'm a worker bee. My dad was a worker yeah. bee. He was a steel, he was a steel worker at Standard Press Steel. A lot of people give me the compliment of the, being the hardest working man in show business, which I really appreciate. Uh, I wish I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk to me about that. Have to you work travel, somewhere. you travel a lot and you do, and you mentioned yeah. corporate gigs and that's really interesting. So a corporation will hire you for say their big annual event. And you'll yeah, go to a national you'll sales meeting. I used yeah. to do the national sales meeting for AT and T. I would host their meetings. These were big. I mean, you just couldn't imagine how big these were. And I didn't even know about this world. This world I found out about accidentally through a buddy of mine when I first started out performing and trying to be an actor in New York. And I said, I need a job. And he said, You don't need a job. He said, You need work. Actors need work. Actors yes. don't need jobs. Yeah, and I was like, oh, no that's job. an interesting. I was like, that, it's semantics, but I thought that's very interesting. And he was the one who told me about a corporate work. And I, I literally had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't know about trade shows. And, I, you know, this is a long, long. This sure. is Funny work. how you fall into things, right? Yeah. yeah. And I did my yeah. very first corporate job. I was doing stand up at the time and I had booked a job at, and I was hating stand up because I had, I didn't realize how brutal stand-up was you know you drive to Dayton Ohio to play the chuckle hut for four days <laughs> and they put you in a broom closet and they're like oh this is this is where I'm staying oh my god so the I had chuckle a, hut. the chuckle <laughs> hut <laughs> and I did a, I did a show in of all places I was in Lancaster at Villa East which was, a, which was actually a pretty good comedy club. It was like a five night a week, which a lot of clubs don't do that anymore. And this is eight, and this is 96, 97. And I was performing there. And the next week I had my first big corporate job where they flew me first class to Florida, to, to Orlando. They had a limousine waiting to pick me up. Um, stayed in the, the Dauphin or the Swan at, at Disney World and worked with this amazing production team of all people from Broadway. So this was like a universe I didn't even know existed. And then as soon as I got there, I was like, this is where I want to be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Be. Got the limo be, service. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to be, I want to be paid great. I want to work. My whole thing is I want to work with really talented people. I want to work with people that are going to elevate me and I'm going to elevate them. I'm going to give 110%. And doing these shows, um, when you're doing a show and it's got a budget of a, a, over a million dollars, you're just, it, it's incredible. And you get to be in front of a, a very smart, engaged audience. A lot of this stuff doesn't translate. You know, I can't put it on credits. I, casting directors don't care. But it makes me such a better performer because sure. I'm getting so much time. You know, I'm the, you know Mac- Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. I'm getting those 10,000 hours. You do know, you have to, uh, when you write the, the script for your performance, do you have to gear it towards the company? You know, if it's at and yeah whatever yeah, I'm on the phone. And <laughs> you know, you one of the make- things I've actually found out I was good at, I was able to take dense content and make it understandable. So I have kind of a specialty in that area. Like even before VoIP came out, VoIP phones, I had to do a thing for Lucent where I had a, I was r- working with the technical people and I got to write the script and they were like, Oh, this is great. You really made it much more understandable than we could have. Cause they're kind of seeped in the technology. And do you remember the SD cards? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. I, I was, remember floppy disks. Yeah. <laughs> so well, the SD I cards, I introduced the SD card. I worked for the association that created the SD card and they hired me and I did that for 
15 years to the point where it became they were ubiquitous. Yeah, right. That's so amazing. Yeah. It is because I, I don't know. I don't I love learning and I'm really curious and I love going from, you know, doing something from Mako Auto Body to AT&T to Lucent for VoIP and then the SD card. It's really very satisfying. That's again, a great. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, do they give you the here's like here's the information you figure it out or do they give you kind of a framework of what to do? Is it different? Yeah, the, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, we'll decide on like, is it a character? Is it not a character? Is it a humorous approach? I'll pitch them different ideas. You know, for the SD card, uh, early on, they had such, it, it popped up in a few things, but they were putting it in everything like microwaves and phones and, you know, you, you your printer. So I had written one where I was just a guy at home and I was just moving the card between each one and having a conversation with my invisible wife, you know, <laughs> so but but you know having you know integrating the characters and everything else is always always a big part of that but really? honestly after i did that corporate show i pretty much stopped stand up because i was like what really? am i doing yeah why am you i know, doing this yeah why am i doing why am i driving 3 4 500 miles to make peanuts mm -hmm. and you know and and i loved it i learned a lot i learned to be a much better writer learned timing and to get on stage and you know how to take how to have an audience respond to you because you literally i mean this is no joke you've got about 7 to 9 seconds and you've got to come out. You can't be overconfident, but you have to be confident enough that they want to listen to you. Because if you drop the ball, you're dead. You're dead. You're kidding. Seven to nine seconds? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'll give you, you the perfect example. There. I remember doing an eight o'clock show at a club and I killed. I mean, I absolutely killed. And I came out at 10 and I bombed. I'm like, what, what happened? You know, but if you're not on your game and that's why, and I, uh, comedians are amazing. And that's why they're so valuable that yes. they, they know from that they are in, they are in it. Their persona's on fire the second they walk on stage. And that's mm -hmm. so important. I couldn't even imagine doing something. I, for, I would be, do you get nervous? Cause I would be nervous. I, get, I would. Yeah. I, stand up makes me, stand up is the only thing that makes but even these corporate I, events, you're fine going out. I'm fine because I'm behind a mask. I'm I'm the character, yeah. and uh -huh. I can become the character. You know what I mean? You people are horrible. <laughs> you're absolutely horrible. You know, they, they, it kind of buys you. You're a character as opposed to yourself. You know, when you get on stage and you are yourself, that's the hardest thing to be. You're yeah. totally vulnerable. You're you're basically saying like like me or hate me, whatever it is. But yeah, you that's, have these uh, I the give anybody credit. You. I'll tell you, I give you credit because that is just who you are putting yourself out there and even doing the corporate thing. I mean, you yeah. know, you still well, have did, to be funny there as well. So I did a show the other night in Tampa for a big medical device company. And I was me. I was me. And I was like the first time I had been nervous in a while, but you know, you just go out there and, and again, it's a corporate audience. They're not going to like throw tomatoes at me. No. <laughs> And at the price of tomatoes right now, I'd be like, hey, let me grab that one. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, but, you know, it's 10,000 hours. It's having the experience. It's having the confidence and, and luck. Yeah. And, and I've been very lucky, you know, like, you know, in the last three years, joining the Howard Stern team as Trump and having the years at Conan and Kimmel and James Corden. It's just been so, it's been so incredible. It's well, the harder incredible. you work, the luckier you get, as they yeah, say. Yeah, you know? and boy, you, you know yeah. that too. You, you, yeah. you know that this is, not, nothing is handed to you. No, nothing, nothing. is. Yeah, yeah, but so how do you how do you deal with all the travel? And what was it like over the pandemic? Were you sort of like, I kind of, you know, as horrible as that was, uh, did you kind of like the downtime or were you like, I got to get out of here? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's funny because I've, you know, I had mentioned when we spoke before that I'm usually on the road about 25 to 30 weeks a year pre pandemic and to be home and to be like, you're home. Like you're not going anywhere. Nothing's happening. No, none of us and, were. Yeah. And that first year I really lucked out. I did a lot of, I, I'm on cameo. I did like hundreds of cameos, hundreds of them. And it was really great. I was working all the time and we started doing virtual stuff and I was doing things remotely. And, and I have a TV studio here in my house. So we're sh shooting things. So I'd shoot things and people would have online meetings 
And then I had the audio studio and I would do radio call-ins and Stern and do voiceover work. And then I have the green screen. I was like, this is great. And, and I was reading a lot. And, you know, I, I, I don't really have the time to read as much as I want, but I read like 75 books over, mm-hmm. over COVID. So, and that was because I wasn't wasting so, and I hate the word wasting, but yeah. so much time when you travel is getting it's a lot the of airport, time. Yeah. checking in at, at the United desk getting through, uh, you know, TSA, going to get some food, uh, yeah. hitting the bathroom before you get on the plane, waiting in line to get on the plane. You're on the plane for five or six yeah. hours. Then you get out and you, and when all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I, I travel's a waste of time. Yeah. I kind of like this virtual world, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm doing my work. I'm getting it done. And, and, and I, you know, and I've, I've done so much traveling. I've been lucky to travel around the world, but it's, it, it, I really, it, it really woke me up to the fact that when you travel as much as someone like me, you time is so valuable. Yes. So yes. I'm trying to really optimize all the time. Uh, my last few jobs, I was listening to books. I was journaling when I could. I was reading mm. when I could, and just really being very aware. You know, one of the quotes that I, I love is, I don't know who said it, but it's later than you think. And I always want to be <laughs> aware of that. Yes. Fact. And the older we get, the more yeah, of that statement get, is true. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I am closer to the end than the beginning. Me so, too. Well, we went to high school together and you think right. about that, you know, when you're 18 or whatever, 15, you think it's endless time. And yeah. as you get older, I would say, once you're over the hill, you pick up speed because yeah. you do. And once you get older, you start to think like every moment is precious. I feel the same exact way now. And now, now that you're traveling again, are you glad to be back? Or do you wish you had a little bit more balance? <laughs> it's, it's like a double-edged sword. I, I mean, I just finished up in Tampa. I'm going to Chicago um, in a, it, it, like in Two, less than two weeks and Michelle, my fiance is coming with me. So that's really nice. And we, we love Chicago. And then I go right to Montreal Ugh. and then I go right <laughs> to San Diego. A and lot. it's like, it, this is a, it, it's great. I feel so blessed, but is there a way that I can do this where I don't have to travel as much and I can enjoy my home sure. and be more productive? You got to get more radio gigs because you got to do phone. more voiceovers. I've got to do <laughs> voiceovers. more voiceovers. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's your, it's what you do. But do, is there ever a time that you're just like, I'm just not into this today? I'm just not. I mean, we all have a day like that. We, when we go to our regular jobs, there's yeah. a day you're just like, okay, it's not, not my best day. How do you get yourself? You have to be up. You have to yeah. be on. You know, like you said about you were on in the one set and then you did it again and it it just wasn't (laughs) as good. Why? You know, you did the same thing. Well, you know, that's that's a golf game right there. (laughs) That's kind of the same thing as a golf game. But but what is it that you you do to get yourself up if you're if you have that kind of, you know, the travel was tough or getting into the hotel was tough. I'm sure you've had these moments and things like that. Oh, I I have. And I've actually thought about, I've asked that question to some peak performers Mm. that I know and some people who are also in the industry. Yes. You're very into that, which is great, you know? Yeah. And I just, it's one of these things where this is what you have. You, I'm very lucky that someone is paying me to do what I do. Someone is depending on me to do what I do. Um, There is a weird thing where um, I hate this. I got to put on this frigging wig. You know, all those kind of things. I'm just not into this tonight. And then it's on. And then I, um, I always do a prayer and something to center me before I go on stage. And I say, you know, God, please, this isn't about me. Uh, This isn't about my ego. Let me entertain these people. Let me lift these people up. Let me take them away for 45 minutes from all the things that they have to deal with. And that kind of gets me into the right headspace. And then I do this thing where I open my crown chakra and my root chakra, and I take the energy of the sun and the energy of the core of the earth. I know this sounds all kind of crazy, but it's like, <laughs> it's just my, it's the way I get into this. Yes. And they meet in my body and I'm Catholic. So the, the sacred heart's very, very, has a lot of meaning to me. So I say, I pull that energy in both ways and I activate the sacred heart. And then I picture the room I'm going to 
perform in, I picture the stage and I put white light on the stage. I put white light on the audience and I put white light in the entire room. And from where I'm standing to where I'm walking to the stage, that all becomes white light. And that process pulls me out of that because I'm human yes. and I'm a baby and I can easily <laughs> get aggravated. You know what I mean? If someone well, cuts sure. me off in traffic. So, or, or there's, uh, you know, I live here in Las Vegas and I'll have to drive somewhere in town to perform and I'm just why did they accept this job what the hell is wrong with me I don't need to do this you know and then you step on stage you know, you know hello everybody this is this tremendous so well, you are a true performer because I am yeah, sure I'm a prof- you're not the I'm only guy that feels that way you're a professional that's <laughs> yeah. right and like as you said you feel blessed because there are other people out there that aren't as blessed that they're trying to make it that yeah haven't and gotten the jobs kill and, for the opportunities in absolutely the work that and that's what you have to think about let me ask you this when i opened this podcast today i said laughter is the best medicine and i i really feel like that i mean we all know what it feels like to truly belly laugh it just oh my God. it almost almost like a drug like it feels like your whole body relaxes and you just feel so good and you talked about that you said to make people laugh for 45 minutes and just kind of forget their problems especially where we are right now yeah, in our world. Yeah. I mean, we're still kind of coming to the end, I hope, of this pandemic, or at yeah. least learning to live with it a little bit more. And things are opening up again, which is wonderful. But we have gone through a lot and people are still feeling the residual effects of just being so isolated. What yeah, does it feel like so to you when you, when, you, when you make people laugh? How, in, inside, how does that make you feel? It it makes me feel so good. It even goes back to when I was a kid to make somebody laugh to it. It's a couple of things. There's this connection you have with them in that moment that I made, that I said something, I did something that this person, it tickled their funny bone so much that they just laughed out loud and they're having this release of chemicals in their body. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you know, comedians, somebody like Sebastian Maniscalco, who's, who's just risen in prominence because he's Unbelievable. So funny and people, people need to laugh and yes. they don't just need to laugh. This is something that I've discovered um, with COVID. And, and I knew this, but it just really drilled at home. When I'm in front of an audience, like I was in Tampa or anytime pre-COVID, they're laughing, but they're laughing as a community. It's a shared laugh. It's like, I remember going to see in 78, going to see Animal House at the at the Montgomeryville Eric Theater. Remember the Montgomery? We all had Theater? toga parties yeah. back in high school, of yeah. course. <laughs> so you would go there and you'd see this movie in, in this tiny theater. But even though it was a couple of hundred people, it was packed and people were all laughing together. And there's this thing about communal laughter. You know, you can go watch Animal House by yourself. It's just yeah. the same. People always say, yeah, it was good. It just wasn't the same. It's this thing, this communal laughter. There's this kind of empathetic, sympathetic thing that happens that everybody kind of lifts up and it becomes this wonderful thing and people want to share it. You know, people say, I saw Sebastian Maniscalco and there's this thing that he does about the neighborhood and the people stop by or they say Jim Gaffigan and like people want to share those moments with you. No one comes out out of a movie out of a dramatic play and goes, there's this scene where he kills the guy. <laughs> Let me tell you all about it. No one does that. No one does that about Shakespeare. But people will do that with comedians and yes. funny movies because we, oh, yeah. we need that. You know, we we, we, we do. All need we that. need it so much. And we need <clears throat> that connection. And I never, that was such a good point that you make because I never really thought about the community of laughter and yeah. bringing people together like that. And we need that more now than ever. I think we all realize, and you know, we don't want to get into the politics, but our world no. has been so, so divided. And it is something that can bring people together. And it, yeah, it is- anything that unifies people is, is so wonderful. And I think it's so important. And I think about, you know, during World War II, when my dad was a World War II veteran, he went off to the South Pacific, but what it must have been like here in the U.S. when just a massive number of men and boys really i mean some some lied about their age of 16 to yeah, 17 yeah. and disappeared and talk about a dark time where europe is being overrun and england was almost overtaken and all these you've got three major i mean it, 
we are in we are in bad times here because of a lot of things that are happening that, that are echoing that time period. But you have to remain positive. It's the one thing um, that that keeps us all moving. It's like Viktor Frankl's Man Search for Meaning. This guy was in Auschwitz, and one of the most important things you can do is like just stay positive and humor is so valuable and I'm so lucky to be able to, you know, with my videos or TikToks or an Instagram post to be able to make somebody laugh. And um, one of the things that's the most heartwarming to me is during the time when I was doing a lot of videos for YouTube, I was getting messages from people from like, I'm not kidding, like Estonia, um, wow. <laughs> Uzbekistan, all these places where people say, thank you so much. It's been so tough for us. We really appreciate the laughter. And I was just like, and we, it was so nice to see where, where they were from and, and have people comment to know that here I am in my house in Las Vegas, shooting something that's affecting somebody, you know, halfway around the world who's having a difficult time because Absolutely. it's COVID and they can't, they can't, we could can leave our house. Like they can't leave their house. There's yeah. military on the street and, you know, and food's delivered and not delivered, not delivered like DoorDash, like yeah, jokes yeah. And cheese. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, that really, you know, that, that really speaks to me oh, because wow. you're doing something so, you know, people may not look at it like that, you know, no, no. what a comedian does, but it really is so valuable. We do need that. Just like we need yeah. music. We need yeah. art. We need all of that in our lives. We're human beings. hundred percent. And yeah. I think, you, you know, you're doing such a great thing. So what's the future hold for you, John? Uh, the future holds a bunch of these corporate jobs. And one of the goals that I have this year is to get back to acting. Um, I have kept putting it off and putting it off. Uh, but I really want to, I'm very close to LA. I can be there in 40 minutes by plane uh, and get back. And I get the auditions going again and build those relationships with cast and directors and just hopefully get some things on Netflix. And there's so many shows in production. So I just it's incredible how many outlets there are, right? Oh my God. Like, when we were growing up, it was three, six and 10. And that we didn't even have a UHM remote control. Challenge. We had to get up and fix the rabbit ears, right? Yeah, we had to get up <laughs> and get through the snow, you know, and climb up the TV. And, you know, and it was, it was yeah, it was brutal. Yeah. It was horrible. Yeah. I know. But now in some ways, I'm like, there's so much overload. Like, what show do you look at? What streaming service do you buy? At some point, you're just like, I got to cut this off and go outside and do something yeah. other than watch a show, you know, because yeah. it gets to it's, be it's, yeah, oh, it's, too it's, much. You got to get out. It, you got to everything now. I, I'll tell you one of the things I read a great book because, you know, we're in you and I are freelancers. We do have to deal with so much. It's a great book called Willpower. I forget. John Tierney, I think, is one of the writers. These guys are two researchers. And because of the times that we live in right now, um, we have decision fatigue by like 12 noon there's literally we use up the ability to make an informed decision because we have to make all these stupid decisions yes i can see that absolutely <laughs> all, all the time mm -hmm. and it's you know like what, what what streaming platforms do i buy and which show should i watch <laughs> well, how do you work the clicker we can't we have five remotes how do which one <laughs> Right. That, and, and, all these things, and we have to make so many decisions that we never used to have to make right. even 30 years ago. So it, it's kind of wearing us out. So we have to get to a point where, you know, you've got to be judicious going back to this whole time thing we were talking about. We've got to be judicious with our time, with our thoughts, with our decision making, yes. all of these, yes. all of these things, because when you're a freelancer, it, it Every every minute counts in everyone's of life. Of course, but when you've got to make decisions that are affecting your income and how how much time you're going to make, like it's okay to say no to certain yes. things. And I like yes. I had said, I've had to take a little social media diet. Not that anyone's missing me. You know, what I mean? like, where's John? I'm missing John, you. He hasn't. He hasn't. What's he doing? What's he doing? And you, you know, know I, I come before, on, I post nine things. I get right all at once. Before yeah, we go, I do want to ask you. I almost forgot. I did want to ask you. I saw you doing pull-ups, and you know, I I'm a big fitness person, and yeah, I, I love it. Like I think it reconnected. Yeah, and I and I just think it's it's so great that you're doing that. But when you speak about time, I just read an article where people do have the time. 
that's like really kind of a bogus excuse. It's just, yeah, it they is. don't make the time. You, we, we waste a lot of time. We wa- of think of how time. much time you're on your phone scrolling or w- watching a show. Right. That half hour, 45 minutes could have been spent taking a walk or working out or doing whatever it is. So how do you find time? How do you squeeze it in with your crazy schedule? Uh, I'll tell you what. Let me see if I uh, This is what changed everything for me. Hopefully it's right here. Is it here? I don't know. Okay. So this is the book that changed things for me. Um, I've, I've been obsessed with having more time and being able to do more. And I was always not getting everything done. And I came up with um, I, I came up with it. I found if somebody recommended this book to me, if you can see it, it's Miracle Morning. I see and it. Mm-hmm. this book basically says, whenever you used to get up, get up an hour before, mm. a full hour. And then I had seen this other thing by a, a Marine, US Marine talking about getting up at 4.30. So what I did was I split the difference and started getting up at 5.30 every morning. And in that time, I really made a point to center myself as opposed to coming out of the gate like a, a rocket ship and going in all these different directions. Yes, which a lot of people do. Get right. up and get, get out. Yeah, yeah. You're, you know, and, and don't check my phone when I wake up, no mm. matter what, unless like someone's on their deathbed and, you know, um, don't check my phone, have a bulletproof morning routine. So that's like, I get up, I get dressed. I give gratitude right to start the day to kind of write my mindset. Cause what we were talking about before you can get off of that. So I'm just, I'm so thankful for my home and to be able to make a living and my friends and my family. And just, that just really keeps me centered and then have breakfast and then journal. Um, I I'll do a reading on stoicism and then try to read two pages of the, of the current book that I'm reading and, and make my bed. That's one of the most important mm, things. Yes, I've heard about that. Mm-hmm. And do that every yeah, every day. So every day there's these five or six things and then go work out. Because for me, I have learned because I'm, I, my brain is just, I'm, you know, I've got squirrel brain because I have ADHD and all those wonderful things that I've carried over from my childhood. But, but if you can harness that uh, and get to the gym, it really helps you focus. Absolutely. And, that's, and that's, you cross it off your list because you, cross it off you your wait list. sometimes to the end of the day, something comes up. I did. Tired. I have, I have to tell you, I did that this week. I, I, one of the days this week, I was like, you know what? I'm going to push and I'm going to do this at four o'clock. And I've done this literally a thousands of times. <laughs> and, and I'm, and I'm like, oh my God, do you never learn? So, so I made up the time the next day and put more yes, time in and hit, right. hit all my numbers, but it's, that's the only way you've got to have. And I know that people have kids and this is that, but, but people who are watching this who are maybe our age or a little younger. If mm-hmm. your kids are older, just come up with a bulletproof structure that you can have every single morning, make it your time. There's so yes. many demands on all of us, but make sure you like the, the, the first thing you, there's a saying, you pay yourself first. Well, pay yourself first with time in the morning to get to set your day, set your intentions for the day. And that could be- I really love that. And you're a late night guy. So if you can do it, I mean, you you perform at night. Yeah. And also, and, and you know, I'll leave, a, I'll leave a booking, go right home, get out of my, if I'm in full voice and go right to bed. I, 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 I've done so much socializing and I'll be really strategic if I am going to stay out late. But for the most part, it's like, this was great. I did my show. I have to go home. I have to stay on this because even if I'm living, let's say I live to be 85. Well, mm-hmm. that's 25 years I have left. So that's not a lot of time. So I don't need to stay out another night and drink. I've done that. <laughs> that yeah. knowledge. I, did it, I, did <laughs> I think it. we all, you know those I mean? days are behind us yeah. now, right? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're behind us. And I, I don't need to do that. I showed up. I interacted with people. I've, I've done what I need to do. Mm-hmm. But now I need to leave and go to bed so I can stay on this schedule that has been very, very valuable to me and has been very helpful to me. That is amazing. Well, you really shared some some deep stuff here, John. I mean, more so than I thought that you would get into. And I really appreciate that because you got me oh, thinking. You. And I'm sure you have yeah. other people thinking as well. And yeah, if I'm, someone, 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I'm in a mastermind group and we share a lot of best practices. Mm -hmm. These guys are great guys. And they're a couple of the guys are really peak performers and they're, they inspire me. And I just want to, you know, when you get something that works for you, you want to share it, at least put it out there. Somebody else can try it. I bought a bunch. I bought a stack of these miracle morning books. I just bought a bunch of them and I would meet somebody or have a friend. And I'd say, you know what? I think you'll get a lot out of this book. And I would just give it to them. We'd go to dinner and I'd say, here, just take, read this. I think you'll, you'll really appreciate it. That is really, that is amazing. And, and it's changed your life. It seems it really has. Oh, it has. It, it, it's yeah. really been very helpful. I'm much more centered. I get more done. I feel better. I'm not as moody because I'm setting, I'm setting the day up for success. Mm-hmm. And I'm not just talking about like money. So I'm talking about being pro- productive and centered and spiritual and all those things you need to do to get through the day and not fall off, the, you know, the wagon. Oh so yeah. Because you know, some people get up, get, you know, eat a quick thing or they grab a donut or the whatever, yeah. get to work, pick up the kids, ru- you know, everything's a rush, rush, rush. And, and we do, we don't feel like we have that time, you know, yeah. so give yourself that time in the morning, but it, it really, you made a good point. You got to get to bed a little earlier as yeah, well. You do. And, and, they, and on you the other end, most nights, most nights you're wasting time. You're watching, you're flipping through Netflix or you're do, you know, you're it's something that you can easily cut out of your schedule yes, yes. because that the morning time is far more productive. The evening time people are like, I just want to, you know, decompress. Okay. You've been decompressing for a long time. You don't need that much decompression. <laughs> your decompression is outweighing your productivity. <laughs> Very good. You coined a new saying. I like it. So someone watching, listening is interested in maybe booking you for a corporate event or just to find out more about you, where can they go? They can, um, I'm all over the interwebs. You can go to thejohnnydshow.com. If you want to book me for a cameo, it's cameo, the Johnny D show. Um, I'm pretty much the Johnny D show on all platforms other than Twitter, uh, where I'm uh, Johnny D 23 or something like that. But I'm very proud to announce we now have 6.1 million followers on TikTok. So we're, you know, I'm trying that's to- That's incredible. Do- yeah, that is incredible. Is. Really, oh my and that's, gosh. And that's yeah. really my, uh, my fiance, Michelle, she has really built that because it, it takes a lot of time to spot the trends and shoot the videos. And she's just, she's the director. She tells me what to oh, do. Oh, you got to love that. that. You yeah. really do. That's, that's yeah. great to have somebody that's in your corner like that. Yeah, and congratulations. Totally. On your upcoming marriage. That's really wonderful. You sound like you're just happy and doing great. And I'm just so glad to see that, John. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, it took me 60 years and I'm (laughs) almost 60 and I'm like finally hitting my stride. So late Good bloomer. for you. And you're, and you're working on it. I mean, you're making yeah. an effort to do it. It's not just something that happens. So no, no, left. no. And every, you know, and every day I call it every morning I wake up and start the campfire because it goes out when you go into the tent and go to sleep. So every morning you get back up, you go through the woods, find the things to start the fire, put them all together and restart the campfire for the day. Because it's, it doesn't, it's like sleep. You can't store sleep and you can't store your growth. It has to, it has to be done every single day. It's like losing weight. You can't like, you have to be working on yourself every single day. You can't lose 10 pounds in a day, but you can lose 10 pounds in 10 days. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe you can, but <laughs> I'm not sure I could do that. But yeah, it was maybe a little yeah. extreme. Or, yeah, that was may- maybe a little extreme. <laughs> but thank you so much for being with uh, me. This is so much fun. I really, oh, I had a great, great time. You're such yeah. a great interviewer, and I and I had oh, said thanks. before, I so appreciate your your positivity. I remember it back from high school, and I'd like to ask you a question. I know we're <laughs> running a little long, but where does that source? And your brother was this way too. Where does that source of you remember my brother? come from you know I mean you know, I feel kind of the way you feel I feel very very blessed in my life I feel mm-hmm. very appreciative one of the things I have to say is I've had a great family I've had yeah. such love in my life and oh I'm gonna cry now because I lost my mom oh. last year so yeah. but I've had such love and that has pushed me through knowing people care about me you know, right. and yeah. so that gives me that gives me the strength every single day. I have a wonderful husband. I have God bless beautiful kids, um, just a family of support, my brother, my sister. And I just feel very blessed. And I'm, I'm just so happy. And I always say, if you have good health and you're blessed with good health, 
Don't waste it. Do yeah. something. You know, God gave you a, a body for a reason and it gave you a healthy body. Take care of it. It's so, it's just so important. And that's kind of the basis for everything else that I do right. because, you know, work, I met my husband in a gym, working out together all of our lives. That has just kept us focused and centered and, and just, and, and family, the love of family has been just a big, big part of all of it. But thank you That's for beautiful. asking that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, you know, when you when we first reconnected, I was like, oh, I love Robin Lucarini. And then I mentioned to my brother, yeah, we, you know, old school. And I mentioned my brother Mike, and I said, hey, I just reconnected with Robin. I'm going to be on her podcast. She goes, I always liked her. Her and her brother, oh, they were great. And it's like, so nice. you know, we know the Massettis, you know, and it's yep. thinking like these people from high school, I remember their positive energy because positive energy, your positive energy affected me back in in the 80s oh, i mean late really 70s nice. and that's a wonderful thing and that carries over a lifetime i think we all know who the you know pain in the ass needy rotten people were you know but the people, <laughs> but the people who are positive leave this kind of imprint on you and it's like you know what i really liked robin she was such a wonderful person she oh, was always nice. always friendly always kind of inclusive and i just thought i've always thought that about you and some other people we went to high school with and as i've gotten older and i've met some very successful people my thing is like where does this come from? And thank you so much for that answer because I, I really appreciate that. It's and we did. I have to say, we had a beautiful high school. We had some really nice people, and I'm still. Yeah, we had some really. I, I feel really lucky yes. to go on to Wissa Hicken. We had such yes. a diverse group of people, um, very smart people. And I'd say overall, because I've heard horror stories from other people, like overall, like we lucked out. Like everybody yes. was pretty pretty good yeah we had a nice we had a nice class we had a great group you know people don't do a senior class show anymore like we did that we did cool stuff we tried we had beautiful opportunities to go on field trips back then we just had a a lot at Wissick in high school it was a great experience and it launched me into my career today as I started with the video (laughs) and everything then yeah we had the video we had the video department I got to make films I got to write for stuff and it was a wonderful wonderful place with with great educators who really Really, really care. They did. And I definitely got wonderful experience. It, 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 it opened me up to opportunities uh, that I'm still doing today, you know, yeah. and it's just amazing. So thank you so much for sharing your time. I'm going to send this out to all of our classmates. Hopefully they'll watch <laughs> it. And hopefully you can be at the next reunion. Because I would love be to so be there. Fun. Yeah. So we're going to do one of your impressions. A lot of them. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Huge. Thank you, God Robin. bless. If I make it to Vegas, I'll come see you. <laughs> you better. <laughs> I, I will. Better. All right, I will. I'll talk to Thanks. you soon. All see right. You, take care. All right. Bye.